The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Expert Perspectives on the Early Diagnosis of Alzheimer's Disease and the Promise of Novel Therapies on the Horizon. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash FMQ 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to our program. I'm Patricia Stark and today we'll be discussing expert perspectives on the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and the promise of novel therapies on the horizon. Today I'm joined by a great faculty, starting with our chair, Dr. Marwan Sabah, who is a neurologist and the director of the Cleveland Clinic Luruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. Dr. Sharon Cohn, also a neurologist, is the medical director of the Toronto Memory Program and assistant professor at the University of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Michael Weiner is a professor of radiology and biomedical imaging, medicine, psychiatry, and neurology at UC San Francisco in San Francisco, California. And he is the principal investigator of the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. Dr. Adriana Perez is a nurse practitioner and an assistant professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Dr. Soren Matke is a research professor of economics and the director of the Center for Improving Chronic Illness Care at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California. We appreciate all of you for being here today and sharing your expertise. Okay, let's get started with our first discussion topic. Alzheimer's disease is a global health crisis that has a devastating impact on patients, caregivers, and communities as it threatens to overwhelm healthcare systems around the world. Dr. Sabah, what is Alzheimer's disease and how does it develop? Uh, thank you, Ms. Stark. Uh, it is an age-related progressive neurodegenerative disease of the brain that results in dementia, which is characterized by memory loss, cognitive impairment, and functional impairment associated with the memory loss. Histopathological disease is characterized by the presence of amyloid plaques, which is in the left panel, neurofibrillary tangles, which is in the middle panel, and uh, glial activation, which is in the right panel. Specifically, amyloid accumulates and eventually coalesces into these plaques, but along the way it causes damage to the milieu. Inside the neur uh, neurons are these neurofibrillary tangles, which are the uh, a result of the trafficking of microtubules being uh, uh, just having challenges and stopped and uh, ultimately disrupting cell function. And uh, neurodegeneration is basically atrophy of the brain and loss of metabolic activity as a result of these two changes. Thank you, Dr. Sabah. Dr. Cohen, what are the different clinical stages of Alzheimer's disease? As of 2011, when the NIAAA diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease were published, we generally think of this disease as falling into three main stages. The preclinical stage being the earliest stage, which is clinically silent, but amyloid is building up in the brain and other pathologies are starting to take hold. And there may be no symptoms at all or very subtle symptoms and the individual tests cognitively normally. However, at the MCI stage of disease, there are symptoms and there is evidence of cognitive impairment, but individuals are still independent in day-to-day -day function. Over time, the MCI stage gives way to the dementia stage where people lose their ability to perform first instrumental activities of daily living and then basic personal self-maintenance skills or BADL as we call them. And the dementia stage of Alzheimer's is often divided into mild, moderate, and severe stage disease. And rather than thinking of three discrete stages, preclinical, MCI, and dementia stage of the disease, we're better off thinking of a long continuum. And there's actually a biologic continuum that underlies this. And perhaps Dr. Weiner will talk more about this. Thanks, Dr. Cohn. So, in summary, what Dr. Sabat said is that we have amyloid, which leads to tau, which leads to neurodegeneration. And what Dr. Cohn said is we have the three clinical stages, preclinical, meaning no symptoms, mild cognitive impairment, and then dementia. And 
there, uh, what we know is, uh, and what the slide shows, is that the first thing that happens is the development of the amyloid plaques, as shown on that curve that's on the left. And that occurs for at least 15 years prior to the development of dementia. The development of the amyloid plaques leads to the tau, uh, the, the formation of tau, and then we get uh, a neurodegeneration. And finally, as we come on the right, you see declines in memory and functional impairments. We'll come back to all these biomarkers later. Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Dr. Sabat, what medical assessments and tools do you use to diagnose patients with mild cognitive impairment or dementia? Importantly, uh, we have to take a structured approach. Uh, you would start with a patient and family history, but I want to be very clear that my approach is to use a structured interview-based approach using a validated uh, questionnaires such as the AQ, IQ code, or AD8. Then I would do a bedside cognitive assessment such as a MOCA, mini mental, CPCOG, or mini cog. My preference is to do a mini uh, is to do a MOCA. Then I am uh, thorough in doing a good physical and neurological exam, uh, and then I would look for other causes to be excluded, such as lab tests, imaging, structural imaging, to exclude other pathologies. But in the that is the historical and traditional approach, uh, we need to move beyond that because we're using a diagnosis of exclusion which is no longer where we need to go and if we're going to bring monoclonal antibodies. So we will want to be considering the use of uh, uh, disease-specific biomarkers. So the way we've been approaching it right now is to just exclude other conditions like thyroid disorders, uh, stroke, uh, hydrocephalus, uh, brain tumors, and vitamin deficiencies, but that is not a very accurate, only 70% accurate. So we need to be more precise, and that's where the disease-specific biomarkers will come into place. Well, in addition to what Dr. Sabah has said, we can use MRI to help rule in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease pathology because the hippocampus, which is the area where uh, memories are encoded, uh, shrinks early in the disease. Uh, in more advanced uh, stages, the uh, parietal and temporal lobes also show atrophy. So this is a way that uh, MRI can help rule in the disease. Uh, MRI also, of course, shows evidence for cerebrovascular disease. We see lacoons, we see strokes, we see white matter lesions, some of which is shown here on this slide. Cerebrovascular disease is an important co-pathology, which means that when people have Alzheimer's disease pathology, amyloid tau and neurodegeneration, they very often have cerebral vascular disease, which really adds to the disease burden. Furthermore, cerebral vascular disease can certainly occur in the complete absence of Alzheimer's disease. So it's possible to see a patient with mild cognitive impairment or even dementia with severe cerebral vascular disease, we would call that vascular dementia, in the absence of any amyloid pathology. So sometimes cerebral vascular disease is the cause of MCI and the cause of dementia by itself. And sometimes when people also have Alzheimer's disease pathology, the cerebrovascular disease shown on MRI is a co-pathology which adds to the burden. Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Dr. Cohn, what other conditions need to be considered in the differential diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, there are so many, and we've heard about ruling out strokes and, and tumors, and, and that's very important. We need a structural image to do that, and Dr. Sabah has talked about and Dr. Weiner as well about ruling in Alzheimer's pathology, looking at the hippocampus and, and other, other ways to be sure we've got it right. But there are many other conditions that are not easily ruled out with a blood test or an MRI scan. And these include things like depression, anxiety, which can take a toll on one's memory and bring about cognitive complaints. They can either be the cause of the cognitive impairment or an exacerbating factor. And one could be developing Alzheimer's disease concomitantly. Uh, things like obstructive sleep apnea, where careful history and a different kind of test, maybe a you know, polysomnogram, is going to be the way to ferret out uh, the relative contributions of a sleep disorder versus possible Alzheimer's disease. And many other conditions people have had, minor head injuries in the past, maybe a few concussions, nothing dramatic on a structural brain image, but one wonders and needs to take into account in the history how much those prior injuries to the brain might be 
uh, contributing. And finally, there are a host of neurodegenerative dementias, which are not Alzheimer's disease, which can either coexist or uh, mimic Alzheimer's disease. And these would include things like Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal degeneration. It is also important to be aware of language barriers or cultural differences that may cause a patient without mild cognitive impairment or dementia to score low on a cognitive screener. In addition, uh, we need to pay attention to symptoms that may suggest other etiologies such as delirium, Parkinsonian symptoms, for example, tremors, rigidity, stiffness, hallucinations, and delusions. Thank you, Dr. Cohn and Dr. Perez. Dr. Sabat, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has repeatedly recommended against universal cognitive screening for older adults, saying that current evidence is, quote, insufficient to assess the balance of benefits and harms of screening for a cognitive impairment. Do you agree with their position on this? No, I don't. I think it's unfortunate and short-sighted. If you go for in for your annual Medicare wellness visit, you're getting screened for osteoporosis, colon cancer, breast cancer, high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, but they decided to ignore and specifically exclude uh, cognitive screening. The reason this is unfortunate and short-sighted is, you know, early detection can be used uh, to help people make their own decisions early on. It can help preserve functioning. It could uh, allow for long-term care planning. It could also allow for people to engage in clinical trials and get ready for uh, disease-modifying therapies. So not having this available to us uh, allow is really uh, impeding physicians screening for this on a regular basis, and so subsequently we'll see more and more people coming in in the more impaired phase. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for an insightful discussion about Alzheimer's screening and diagnosis and the benefits of identifying at-risk patients early in the disease course. So now let's focus on neuroimaging, cerebrospinal fluid, and plasma-based biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease that are currently used in the clinic or are in clinical development. Dr. Cohn, what is the ATN framework for classifying and diagnosing Alzheimer's disease? The ATN framework dates to uh, the work of Clifford Jack et al. 2018, and it provides a biological framework for describing and and uh, diagnosing, if you will, Alzheimer's disease. It's a continuum that starts with A, which stands for amyloid or cerebral amyloidosis, T, which stands for tau, and more specifically, the hyperphosphorylated tau, which is the tau abnormality in Alzheimer's disease, and the N of the ATN stands for neurodegeneration. It is very, very helpful to think of Alzheimer's disease, not just clinically, but biologically, because in part, there are so many mimics. If we just go by clinical phenotype, as Dr. Sabah said, we'll be wrong 30% of the time or more. And if one has no amyloid present by whatever test one uses to, to uh, you know, comply with the ATN framework, then no matter how amnestic they are, no matter how gradually progressive and profound their memory impairment is, they do not have Alzheimer's disease. They do not have a key pathologic change necessary for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. There are established and will be further future biomarkers that can help fill in the ATN framework. Currently, as far as neuroimaging, we have imaging modalities that can inform us about amyloid, that can inform us about tau, and also about neurodegeneration. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Dr. Weiner, can you please explain what amyloid PET scans are used for? Sure. Uh, most physicians today are diagnosing Alzheimer's disease by uh, the clinical criteria that we've discussed before. But what we've tried to explain is that Alzheimer's disease is a pathology with amyloid plaques, tau, and neurodegeneration. The only way to really make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease definitively is to demonstrate that somebody has the amyloid plaques or tau or neurodegeneration in the brain. And amyloid PET imaging is the only imaging modality that's approved to really nail down the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease pathology. 
Uh, so these are radioactive tracers that are injected. People are in a PET scan and the brain lights up, as you can see on the slide, for somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. Whereas people who are either cognitively normal or people who have mild cognitive impairment and dementia from some other cause, not Alzheimer's disease, will show a negative PET scan. So it's basically a tool, it's an expensive tool, but it is a tool which reliably diagnoses the presence of Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain. Now, another way to assess the brain a function is to do an FDG PET scan. FDG PET is a marker of neuronal activity and neuronal injury. FDG is also approved for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And there are changes in FDG PET which reflect Alzheimer's disease pathology. But FDG PET is not specific for Alzheimer's disease. It's, it's somewhat nonspecific. So the most specific test is a uh, amyloid PET. Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Dr. Sabah, would you mind giving an overview of the CSF biomarkers that have been studied in patients with AD? Yeah, so the CSF profile has been studied extensively on um, multiple studies, over 200 studies, uh, totaling over 20,000 patients. We know that uh, measuring amyloid, specifically AB-42, total tau and phosphorylated tau, have all been shown to have very, very high specificity uh, and very good sensitivity. And the reason this is important is that we would measure the three proteins, A, beta 42, total tau, phosphorylated tau, and then create a, a profile called an amyloid tau index. The ADNI study that Dr. Weiner is a PI of has shown that if you're uh, in mild cognitive impairment and you have low amyloid and high tau, the probability of progression to Alzheimer dementia is over 90% in the next year. So it's highly predictive of progression and it's highly accurate in the diagnosis. I do want to say, though, there are two other uh, uh, amyloid, actually, two other CSF uh, features that are being investigated that could be useful in the future, including neurofilament light uh, called NFL and two forms of tau, P tau 181 and 217. So what I'm saying is that the specificity and sensitivity are very good now, but they're likely to get even better as time goes on. Thank you, Dr. Sabah. Dr. Weiner, would you review some of the CSF amyloid beta biomarker data, please? Measuring amyloid in the cerebral spinal fluid, which is obtained from lumbar puncture, is another way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain, in addition to the amyloid PET scan. The reason why the amyloid beta 42 goes down in the cerebral spinal fluid is because the amyloid beta 42 is sticking to the amyloid plaques. So there are fundamentally two ways to diagnose Alzheimer's disease pathology. One is by measuring the amyloid in the cerebral spinal fluid, and the other is by doing an amyloid PET scan. Amyloid PET scans are much more expensive. Performing lumbar punctures and uh, measuring uh, amyloid in the cerebral spinal fluid is a less expensive approach to the diagnosis, but there is resistance on the part of healthcare providers and patients for doing a lumbar puncture, and we'll have to see uh, which modality is useful as we go into the era of disease-modifying treatment, which will largely or likely uh, require uh, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease pathology. Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Well, now let's discuss the blood-based biomarkers. Dr. Matke, will you give an overview of these biomarkers in AD, please? Of course, um, with a disease as common as Alzheimer's, we definitely need a blood test because as Dr. Weimer has just explained, PET scanning is very expensive and CSF testing is not exactly popular with patients. So we need a test that is scalable and can ideally be done in primary care settings to handle the large amount of anticipated patients. We would like to get, get these tests, but we can also imagine how challenging it is to um, develop them because only very small amounts of um, amyloid and, and tau protein pass through the blood-brain barrier. So the technology behind these tests is very complex, and until recently, only highly specialized labs were actually able to conduct them. But more recently, um, we have seen automated tests emerge that run on standard lab equipment. So you can basically draw blood in, in any prim primary care office, send it in and obtain a test for Alzheimer's disease once these tests become commercially available. 
in a perfect world, these tests would have such high concordance with PET or CSF testing that we could actually ma make a diagnosis just on the blood test. But even if the sensitivity and specificity of these tests is worse than PET and or CSF testing, they could at least serve as a sort of first step to identify patients that then need to undergo those more invasive or more expensive diagnostic modalities. Last fall, uh, a company called C2N received clear approval for their first amyloid uh, blood test for Alzheimer's disease. This is very exciting because this means that blood tests are available to clinicians throughout the United States from this company. Uh, they're measuring amyloid beta 42 over 40 in plasma. And as you can see on that upper left portion of the slide, people who are amyloid PET positive, that is they have Alzheimer's disease pathology measured by amyloid PET scan, have lower levels of amyloid 42 over 40 than people who are amyloid PET negative. And there's been extensive uh, studies of this and the uh, ability to pr uh, predict whether somebody's amyloid PET positive from their uh, plasma amyloid level is quite high. So this is very exciting because it raises the potential that we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease by a blood test. But in addition to measuring amyloid beta 42 over 40 in plasma, there's other uh, metabolites that can be measured. For example, we can measure phospho tau. And this past summer, a, a number of very exciting research papers came out showing that measuring something called phospho tau 217 and also phospho tau uh, 181 uh, are predictive of Alzheimer's disease pathology as well. Phospho tau 217 and 181 go up as there's more tau pathology in the brain. And finally, there's uh, something called neurofilament light, which Dr. Sabai mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, it can be measured in the cerebral spinal fluid, but now it's been shown that uh, neurofilament light protein goes up in many diseases with neurodegeneration, including Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it, so neurofilament light is not highly specific for Alzheimer's disease. It's a measure of neurodegeneration. But the overall message here is that we know that Alzheimer's disease is amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration. And now with plasma testing, we can measure amyloid, we can measure tau, and we can measure Neuro, uh, neurodegeneration, and these tests are going to have big clinical impact. On this slide, which we talked about earlier, we see the progression of the biomarkers from amyloid on the left to the development of tau in the middle to uh, uh, the development of neurodegeneration on the right. And uh, this shows that these biomarkers, which can be measured in plasma, can be measured uh, with the cerebral spinal fluid and also with amyloid PET can track the progression of the disease. An important point to make here is that even people who are completely normal have developing Alzheimer's disease pathology, which can be detected by the PET scans of the cerebral spinal fluid and the plasma. But as people enter a symptomatic mild cognitive impairment, a very important question is, is the mild cognitive impairment being caused by Alzheimer's disease pathology or by something else? And now we have tools to identify Alzheimer's disease specifically. And these are gonna become very important once we have disease modifying treatments for Alzheimer's disease, because we don't wanna be treating somebody who's symptomatic from something other than Alzheimer's disease with a, uh, a treatment aimed at Alzheimer's disease pathology. So the use of, of plasma tests, cerebral spinal fluid, and amyloid PET scans are going to be critical to determine who qualifies for Alzheimer's uh, disease modifying therapy. Well, thank you all. This was a really comprehensive examination of where we are now and where we are going with biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. So let's now shift focus to the evolving Alzheimer's disease treatment landscape. Dr. Cohn, can you review the current treatment options that are available for Alzheimer's disease, please? Yes, we have two classes of medications that have been approved quite a few years ago, specifically for Alzheimer's disease. The first class consists of the cholinesterase inhibitors. These boost the amount of acetylcholine at the synapse and consist of denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. 
The second class, also a neurotransmitter-based therapy, uh, is an NMDA antagonist known as memantine. There's only one drug in this class, and it modulates the amount of glutamate at the synapse. So the cholinesterase inhibitors are indicated for mild through to severe stage Alzheimer's disease dementia, while memantine is indicated for moderate to severe stage Alzheimer's disease dementia. There are other medicines that we borrow from psychiatry to help mitigate the neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia, but these are not specific to Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. And Dr. Perez, what are some of the AEs and other limitations associated with these agents? Yes, so first, the treatment benefit is modest, and they do not halt the disease progression. Uh, second, they are not approved for use with MCI patients. And third, the cholinesterase inhibitors have a strong class effect around GI adverse effects, so for things like nausea, weight loss, and anorexia. And so it's important to really uh, teach our patients and caregivers about these limitations. Thank you. And Dr. Sabah, what does the Alzheimer's emerging treatment landscape look like as of 2020? Yeah, so the good news is despite the limitations in terms of available treatments, there are a lot of drugs in uh, the pipeline for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, including many biologics and small molecule disease modifying therapies, as well as uh, symptom reducing therapies that are in development. In this slide that we're showing, uh, there is uh, my colleagues and I publish every year uh, shows kind of what I call the wheel of fortune. And there are over 120 drugs uh, uh, in development for Alzheimer's disease at every stage, whether it's preclinical, mild cognitive impairment, mild dementia, moderate dementia, and severe dementia. Uh, when we uh, look down in the, de uh, in the categories from phase one to phase three, as I said, there's already 120 agents that are approved in development. 94 of those are in phase two or phase three, meaning they've past the phase one safety profile, including some that are targeting 80 symptoms, meaning cognitive symptoms, uh, symptomatic effects, or neuropsychiatric symptoms, which are a huge driver of morbidity and mortality. And then there are a lot of more uh, what we call DMTs or disease-modifying drugs. These include uh, drugs that target or remove amyloid or a beta, target or remove uh, tau, including monoclonal antibodies or vaccines, Targets drugs that improve synaptic activities, synaptic plasticity, synaptic growth, some that are target inflammation, infection, and immunity, some that improve metabolism, as we talked about with neurodegeneration, you have loss of metabolic activities, some that affect the proteinopathies, proteostasis. Uh, Interestingly enough, now we're starting to see drugs and treatments that are focused on improving vascular function. Uh, there are now some drugs that are affecting growth factors, hormones, genetics, and epigenetics. So what I'm trying to say to you is that there's a lot of drugs uh, with a lot of targets. Uh, some of the things that we need to understand is that most drugs are uh, targeting MCI and mild AD dementia, uh, and very few fewer drugs are targeting later stages of the disease. There are, excitingly, uh, some primary prevention trials. The idea that we would target the disease before the onset of symptoms, there are a lot of drugs in development and a lot of trials in development for that. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are the farthest along, and you see there are four monoclonal antibodies that are uh, in phase three or entered phase three or actually have finished phase three, uh, so we'll have more drugs uh, we'll have some discussion around that. But the disease-modifying approaches of removing amyloid is move, have gone from being theorized to now uh, nearing a clinical approval, potentially. So the tau antibodies and vaccines are next in the pipeline, and we'll have to wait and see. Thank you, Dr. Sabah, for providing the overview of the emerging therapy treatment landscape. Dr. Cohn, would you please give an overview of aducanumab? Absolutely. Great interest in aducanumab because of how far along it is in its development. This is an anti-A beta monoclonal antibody that targets amyloid that is uh, fibrillar, meaning oligomers, uh, protofibrils, and plaque-bound amyloid. And in its large phase three program, which consisted of two trials, Engage and Emerge, uh, targeting individuals who had 
early Alzheimer's disease defined by MCI due to Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's disease dementia, all of them with disease confirmed by a PET amyloid scan, what we saw in the Emerge study was that for those individuals on high-dose aducanumab, which was a monthly uh, IV infusion of uh, aducanumab versus placebo, high or low dose, with the high dose, what we saw is that the study met its primary clinical outcome measure, which was the CDR. It met its secondary clinical outcome measures, which consisted of the MMSE, the ADAS-COG, and the MCI-ADL-ADCS, so a, a functional scale, as well as meeting exploratory outcome measures on the NPI and biomarker outcome measures with target engagement, as shown by amyloid clearance, as well as impact on downstream biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So while eMERGE was positive in its high-dose arm, ENGAGE was not, and a subgroup of those patients in the ENGAGE study, when looked at based on post hoc analysis, these individuals who had the high dose exposure for the longest period of time had benefits similar to those in the eMERGE study. So it is felt that dose matters. And if we look at the groups with the highest dose exposure, there was benefit. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Lucanumab is another monoclonal antibody currently in phase three clinical trial. Dr. Sabat, would you please tell us about what the results have been reported from the phase two and phase three lucanumab trials? Yes, so lucanumab is uh, also known as BAN2401, and the mechanism of action is it's a humanized monoclonal antibody that binds with high affinity to the aggregated forms of amyloid or A-beta, promoting FC receptor-mediated phagocytosis. So it binds it, and then you have a secondary effect of the phagos phagocytosis. It has a lower affinity for monomers, so it is a specific form of amyloid that it pursues, meaning the oligomeric species and not the monomeric species. That demonstrates that it can remove amyloid with very, very robust uh, effects with uh, uh, up to 90% of amyloid removed. And the large phase two trial that was recently completed had infusions, uh, multiple doses, 800 patients, uh, uh, multiple arms in the study, and showing that uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram intravenous infusion every two weeks had the most robust effect, and that, that prompted the, the entry into the phase three clinical trial. If you look at this slide here, you see that the interim analysis showed that the lecanemab uh, resulted in a dose-dependent reduction in ADAS-COG, 47% uh, reduction in ADAS-COG. And remember, I told you that in that high-dose group, uh, they had a 90% reduction in amyloid to the point where amyloid became almost undetectable on the PET scan. So we know that amyloid removal was very robust, and you started to see over time a slowing in the rate of decline, 47% uh, reduction. Uh, so this suggests that we have a target dose, 10 milligram per kilogram IV every two weeks, uh, and that it can be predictable. Well, thank you for reviewing that data, Dr. Sabah. Dr. Cohn, would you mind sharing the results that were recently reported from the Phase two denanumab study? Yes, yeah, sure. So denanumab is also an anti-A beta monoclonal antibody. This one uh, targets plaque-bound amyloid. So it is very specific for amyloid plaque. And all of these monoclonal antibodies, even though they target amyloid, have a little bit different uh, binding mechanism and different uh, targets for amyloid. With this one, uh, in January, we learned results of the first phase two study, um, which showed that denanumab treatment in early Alzheimer's disease, again, MCI and mild AD dementia, met its outcome measure, its clinical outcome measure, which was this primary outcome measure, on an integrated Alzheimer's disease rating scale, which is a, a composite of a functional scale and a cognitive scale, and showed 32% less decline compared with placebo. 
So that, that is a, a percentage less decline that most clinicians feel is meaningful. If you can slow down the disease at the early symptomatic stage and keep people functioning well for longer, that is worthwhile. From the biomarker standpoint, what we saw in this phase two trial was that there was a dramatic reduction in amyloid, so dramatic target engagement. And you've heard from Dr. Sabah and you heard from me earlier about aducanumab being able to lower amyloid substantially and lecanumab being able to lower amyloid substantially. But what we see in the denanumab study is that there is a rapid lowering of amyloid. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. And Dr. Weiner, what do we need to know about amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, or ARIA? All monoclonal antibody treatments which remove amyloid plaques are associated with ARIA, or, am or amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. Uh, there's two types of ARIA. The most common is the brain's brain swelling caused by brain edema, or ARIA-E, but there's also sometimes a bleeding in some parts of the brain associated with ARIA. And this is something, this is, these are a concern. Most of the ARIA is asymptomatic, but there are some people who do get symptoms and some very occasionally severe symptoms from ARIA. So in all of the studies of these monoclonal antibodies, there has been frequent MRI monitoring of people during the dosing uh, regimen and if people are showing ARIA, even if it's asymptomatic, sometimes the dosing is stopped to allow the ARIA to clear before dosing is continued. Uh, I think that as we go forward with this, we're going to learn better how to manage it, how frequently the MRIs need to be done, and hopefully, ultimately, uh, the treatment schedules can be worked out to minimize the ARIA and minimize the need for frequent MRI monitoring. Great. Thank you. And thank you all. It has been very exciting to hear about disease-modifying therapies that may be able to prevent or significantly slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So in this last section, we'll talk about the surge of patients that will need to be screened and treated for Alzheimer's disease once a disease-modifying therapy becomes available and highlight the team approach to address this unmet need. So Dr. Mackey, can you begin by reviewing the capacity constraints that are expected to act as treatment barriers in the first decade after a disease-modifying therapy is approved? Of course, yes. Um, as my colleagues had pointed out, this is a disease that we need, to, uh, we need to use a preventive approach to treating Alzheimer's disease because we cannot reverse cognitive decline. We need to find it early and treat it early. The downside with such preventive approaches is that patients are actually much harder to find as those with severe symptoms. So you have large numbers of patients that need to undergo a fairly complex um, evaluation and diagnostic process in order to find the ones who we can treat. So in 2017, we did a study and looked at the preparedness of the U.S. healthcare system to deal with that situation. And the situation arises because the first disease-modifying treatment will be available to a large pool of prevalent patients who currently have no disease-modifying option. This is a little similar to what we had seen in hepatitis C when wait lists for the first direct-acting antiretrovirals were long just because many patients had waited for these drugs to come to market and then had to wait again to get them. So in that study, we actually had estimated how many patients may have to undergo this diagnostic process. And we estimated that there are about 15 million patients in the US that have mild cognitive impairment. About half of them would have mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. And those would go into this diagnostic funnel, which we found to be capacity constrained at every level. We don't have enough dementia specialists who would be able to formally diagnose cognitive decline and also quantify its degree to make sure that the patient is still in a treatable window. We don't have enough of the PET scanners that are currently the only FDA-approved modality in the United States. And we don't even have enough infusion centers to deliver these bi-weekly or monthly infusions. And 
This is not specific to the US. We had repeated that study in many, many countries, and we always find a similar picture that the healthcare systems are just not prepared to deal with these large numbers of prevalent cases. This kind of exercise of planning ahead is so important. My understanding is that within the first few years of a disease modifier coming to the market, there will be an 18-month wait list for people to be diagnosed. And that, that's an incredibly long time for people waiting for a treatment that is now on the market. Um, and between 2020 and 2040, there will be something like 2.1 million people transitioning to dementia, to Alzheimer's disease dementia. So obviously we need to face this challenge head on. The lack of specialists to make the diagnosis is a key bottleneck. And specialists need to think outside of the box and work collaboratively with other healthcare providers, uh, not just family physicians, but other members of the healthcare team in order to divide up tasks and make sure that those individuals who can benefit from new disease modifiers will gain access to them in a timely fashion. I agree, Dr. Cohen. Healthcare providers who manage patients with Alzheimer's disease need to be educated about the need for members of the multidisciplinary team to be prepared to help out in different ways. For example, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and psychologists could be trained in administering the cognitive batteries to allow specialists to focus on interpretation of results and differential diagnoses. And standardization of training, certification requirements, quality assurance, and peer review could be implemented to safeguard the accuracy of these test results. Well, thank you, Dr. Cohn and Dr. Perez. Dr. Mackey, we've talked about training other members of the multidisciplinary care team to conduct neuropsych testing and other tasks to take some of the burden off neurologists and specialty care. Will any of these tasks be shifted to the primary care setting? Yes, absolutely. We need to involve primary care in the evaluation of these patients. For starters, the primary care doctor is the entry point for most patients into the healthcare system. Very few would walk straight to a neurologist, but they usually get referred. And in many countries, they must get referred. And so we need to be able to, we need to educate primary care docs about the need to listen carefully to their patients and to take signs of cognitive declines seriously. They need to understand that those are not consequences of normal aging, and also that formally diagnosing a patient etiology of cognitive decline has therapeutic consequences, even in the absence of a um, disease-modifying treatment. So we need to do more in education. We also need to understand that a patient has a right to know about his or her diagnosis. Put differently, we wouldn't conceal a terminal cancer diagnosis from a patient, even if there were no disease modifying options left, we would still tell the patient the truth and the prognosis. So what do we need to do there? Um, apart from the education, we need to empower primary care physicians to take on a greater role in the early evaluation, because the better they prepare the patients for a referral to a neurologist, um, the fewer people will be what Dr. Press called the false positives that are maybe the worried well or the already um, advanced cases of dementia that have no treatment indication. So we need to give them tools. We need to give them the blood test, ideally. We need to give them easily applicable short memory tests, ideally in electronic form, maybe even in a form that can be completed remotely and that feeds directly into the electronic medical record so that we can speed up and, and automate the cognitive testing with a test like the Mini Mental or Mocha. And we also need to find workflow compatible pathways that are sensitive to the resources available to a primary care setting, because those could be very different in a rural area than in a um, densely populated urban area. And lastly, we have to talk about money. We have the habit of piling more and more responsibility on primary care physicians when they have usually pretty crowded days and pretty densely stacked visits. The Minimental, for example, takes about 15 minutes to administer, 
And that's a lot of time with a typical office visit only taking about half an hour. So we, and it is currently not reimbursed as a separate item in, in the US. So we need to find ways to incentivize physicians to actually perform these complex tasks in the evaluation of patients with cognitive decline and make sure that um, these evaluations are not seen as a distraction, but as an opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Matke. Another treatment barrier that Dr. Matke mentioned was limited access to PET scans. Dr. Weiner, would you like to expand on this a bit more? Sure. Currently, in clinical trials and research, we use amyloid PET for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease pathology. But in the event that we would have a disease-modifying treatment, such as aducanumab or one of the others approved, there would be a huge uh, demand for uh, amyloid PET scans as a diagnostic. And the, the PET scanners currently are heavily used for, for cancer evaluation, cancer staging. And uh, we would have to hugely expand the number of PET scanners if that were the only diagnostic modality. Uh, that's why we're interested in the possible use of lumbar punctures or um, blood tests. The other problem with PET scanners currently, uh, PET scanning currently as a diagnostic, is that it's not covered by uh, insurance for reimbursement, and the scans are, are thousands of dollars. So it's just not feasible for most people to, to pay for that. Now, in the event that we had a disease-modifying treatment uh, that required PET for, uh, for use, if that disease-modifying tr uh, treatment were approved, it's much more likely that the, uh, the Medicare would then start paying for PET scans as a diagnosis, but we'll have to see what happens. So given the problems with uh, availability of PET scanners, uh, Dr. Mackey, perhaps you could talk about the blood-based biomarkers. Of course, Dr. Weiner. Um... The blood tests, as we have stated earlier, are very scalable tools that can allow us to determine at a minimum which patient needs further diagnostic evaluation and, like I said before, in an ideal state would actually be able to make a diagnosis. So we did an analysis that was published last year in which we looked at what effect on wait times uh, such a technology might have. So here on that slide, you see the time scale on the x-axis and the required number of specialist visits in the case that we have a disease-modifying treatment on the y-axis. The dashed green line here, that is our estimate of how many specialist visits are available each year in the US. And if you look here at this blue line, that is how many specialist visits we would need if a patient were re referred to a specialist based on a positive millimental test alone. And you can see that for decades to come, we would remain above the available capacity for specialist visits because there would be so many patients referred without an eventual treatment indication. If you look at the orange line, which uses this scenario in which patients who test positive on the MMSE would undergo a blood test with published specifications, you see that the number of visits to begin with is a lot smaller because we have screened out a lot of people who are not amyloid positive. And then the available number, the needed number of visits pretty quickly drops below the available number, i.e. we can eliminate wait lists. And we can also eliminate, and that is going to be a big plus, a lot of cost because we can avoid unnecessary specialist visits and we can avoid unnecessary PET scanners in patients who will not have a treatment indication. Thank you, Dr. Matke. Dr. Sabah, once patients are deemed eligible for treatment, are there likely to be any challenges associated with assessing disease-modifying therapy? A lot, and I'm afraid to say they're challenging. Uh, first, because there are many disease-modifying therapies that are in development and almost all of them appear at this in the short term to be intravenously administered, infusion centers are going to have to scale up. The scale that we're talking about is far bigger than the capacity of what they can do, so they'll have to, beat, uh, they'll have to boost capacity to meet the patient demand. Second is that memory clinics have the potential to deliver the disease-modifying therapies and treatments, but most uh, do not need to renovate their business model. Most 
uh, memory clinics don't have infusion-based services, so they're going to have to add that. Uh, most of them have limited access to specialist care. Most of them focus on uh, neuropsychiatric features and counseling, and so they'll have to expand to be more rapid in their throughput on the diagnostic. Most uh, will uh, need a medical, a special medicalized practice model to support infusion-based services. Most will need to scale up to be able to do CSF testing or PET test scanning or, or infusion delivery. And most will have different uh, models depending on what they have available. Uh, I can tell you that what we have available at the Cleveland Clinic might be different from what our colleagues have elsewhere. So this is going to be an issue that needs to be considered at a macro level in addition to at each site level. Thank you, Dr. Sabah. Dr. Perez, how important is patient education and community awareness? It is so important. Uh, we need to get the word out to the community and the public about the availability of disease-modifying drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Increasing the public's awareness, interest, and access to cognitive screening and the importance of early diagnosis to optimize outcomes for patients and their families, we need to focus on this. And brain health inequities continue to rise. We need outreach programs to underserved communities to promote brain equity and provide education about Alzheimer's disease. For example, at the present time, African Americans and the Latinx community are more likely to have cognitive impairment, but they are less likely to have had an annual wellness visit or to have been diagnosed with cognitive impairment in, or dementia. So there is also, in some cases, patient resistance and fear, and we need to alleviate that fear with education. Uh, patients and their families are afraid of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease due to perceived stigma that still uh, takes place in many families. And it is important to address this as in the community as well. Thank you, Dr. Perez, and thank you for this great practical discussion. To conclude, could each of you please reflect on what we discussed today and share your key takeaways to our audience? We'll start with you, Dr. Sabah. Thank you for including me today. I think this is a great discussion and very, very well-informed group uh, and experts that I'm uh, honored to serve on this panel with. I want to say that we're in a transformative moment in the field, and it comes in multiple approaches. The transformative approach includes uh, transforming from a diagnosis of exclusion to a diagnosis of inclusion. That's the first thing. That means that we're going to uh, look at biomarker evidence, not just exclude other pathologies, not just include, exclude stroke and tumor and hydrocephalus and vitamin deficiencies, but look at biomarker evidence of disease. And so that means that we're going to uh, alter or revise or update our diagnostic approach. And so that's transformative uh, number one. Transform uh, transformation number two is uh, taking the disease from a terminal disease, as we all know it, to a chronic disease. This is the diabetes and HIV of our time. This is the disease that we'll be able to diagnose early, create a, uh, a targeted regimen that includes disease-modifying therapies that could slow the rate of decline in a way that uh, prevents, delays, postpones the progression to dementia or prevents, delays, postpone the end stages of the disease. So this is a, a, a different way to approach the disease in a way that could have a positive impact in specifically to attain the quality of life. And the third is to create a, the third transformation is to create a, tr uh, a broader model. How do we deliver care to these patients? Not just one pill, see you in six months, but have a whole team that supports the treatment, uh, the DMTs, and uh, helps uh, the patient through their journey. So this is a very exciting time. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Sabah. Dr. Cohen. I completely agree with my colleague, Dr. Sabah. This is a transformative time. We've waited a long time and not waited quietly. There's been a lot of hard work behind the scenes over decades to get to this point but we now have the capability in life to diagnose Alzheimer's disease biologically using the ATN framework. We have blood-based biomarkers beginning with the first coming to the market end of last year and more to follow within the next one to two years, giving us the promise that we will be able to diagnose early and accurately and at the primary care level in not too many years from now. 
And the, uh, the pipeline that we've seen, as I think Dr. Sabah referred to it as the, the wheel of fortune, it is rich with multiple drugs at different stages of development, disease modifying drugs, symptomatic drugs, many in phase two and phase three. And we are not putting our hopes all on one drug, our eggs in one basket. We do think that we will have disease modifiers on the market very soon. And it may be that we'll have a cocktail of treatments, targeted treatments for Alzheimer's disease uh, and ways of monitoring disease progression and, and dealing with this early on when quality of life can be maintained and people can still function independently. So I'm excited about where we're going. We can't get there fast enough. We haven't emphasized enough in this um, last hour how bad a disease this is. We sort of take it for granted. This is a terrible disease and we must have breakthroughs. Yes, all right, very good. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Dr. Weiner. Well, my mom passed away five years ago from Alzheimer's disease and uh, most people still think that Alzheimer's disease is memory loss, cognitive impairment leading to dementia. But we now know that Alzheimer's disease is amyloid plaques, tau tangles, leading to neurodegeneration. And the only way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease for sure is with some kind of a biomarker, such as amyloid PET, measuring amyloid and tau in the supraspinal fluid. And now we have the emergence of the blood test for amyloid tau and neurofilament light. So we, first of all, we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease pathology with some high sensitivity and specificity. Secondly, uh, we have a number of treatments which remove amyloid plaques from the brain, and there's a lot of evidence now that these treatments seem to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. This has been reviewed earlier this hour. So we're very excited that at some point within the next few years or even sooner, we're gonna have approval of a disease modifying treatment and that's gonna create a whole new series of challenges. How do we work people up? How do we screen them? How do we diagnose them? How do we get treatment? How do we follow treatment? But this is uh, the emergence of a really new exciting era in neurodegenerative disease. Yes, exciting indeed, thank you. Dr. Perez. Well, um, you know, I think there are three main takeaways for me, especially as a nurse practitioner and member of the healthcare team. I'm so excited to be a part of this panel, this distinguished panel, because I myself have learned so much through it. And I think the first takeaway is that, that we have to educate ourselves on the research, uh, what's on the horizon, because it is exciting, even though this is a challenging field, there are a lot of new exciting developments and uh, you know, and I look forward to that. Um, second is after, you know, we educate ourselves and know uh, the data and um, uh, the new information that is, um, that is constantly, um, that we're constantly learning about. I think the second thing is to educate our patients. Um, you've heard some of the myths and earlier I talked about some of the stigma that still exists. I think we have to do a good job at educating patients and their families about the new treatments, about side effects, about what they can expect with the different diagnostic procedures. And thirdly, very important to me because in my practice, the majority of my patients are ethnic minority elders who are often excluded from clinical trials for many different reasons, we have to promote uh, brain health equity. And that means a very strategic effort in reaching uh, communities that are historically excluded. And I think uh, we have to do that because especially in those communities, we see these e escalating cases of Alzheimer's disease. Very important points. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Dr. Matke. Yeah, it was a pleasure to participate in this informative and spirited discussion. Indeed, a disease-modifying treatment for Alzheimer's would be one of the most fundamental breakthroughs in medicine of our times, with similar importance for public health, maybe only rivaled um, by the COVID vaccine. Alzheimer's is one of the last population-level diseases with no disease-modifying treatment option available, and it is a devastating illness for patients and families. So 
In light of that, with the potential advent of, of a drug as early as this year, we simply cannot be in a position where we have the treatment and then make patients wait on, on wait lists for its availability and progress on the wait list to a state where they can no longer be treated. We need to do our part to prevent that from happening because that is almost more cruel than having no treatment at all. And we have understood from the COVID pandemic how hard it is to change a healthcare system uh, without adequate preparation. We have also learned how difficult the logistics can be, even if there's a scientific breakthrough like the disease development. In this regard, the um, entrepreneurial nature of the US healthcare system is a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's a blessing because decisions can be made swiftly. A radiologist does not have to wait for government approval to install a second PET scanner. A neurologist can transform her memory clinic into a DMT practice, just like Dr. Sabah explained earlier, and that can be done relatively fast. It is, however, a curse because we have also seen in COVID that decisive action by governments can actually speed up these processes quite a bit, whereas market-based approaches sometimes lag behind because they often wait for demand to develop before investing as opposed to being ahead of demand. Um, just as an example, um, my home state of Bavaria is currently in the finishing stages of a 150 million euro extension to the hospital in Munich in which Alois Alzheimer's discovered this disease with the expectation that this new wing would be dedicated for disease modifying treatment di diagnostics and treatment delivery. So we need similar approaches in the US to get ahead of the curve, to build these facilities, to build capabilities, to build tools while we are still waiting for the treatment to be approved so that we are ready when it comes to the market. Great, thank you all very much. Thank you to the faculty and thank you to everyone for your time today. Thanks very much, have a great evening. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash FMQ 860. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Biogen.